Okay. Can we all hear me? Let me see if I'm muted. Um, okay, no, I'm not muted. So please, can everyone confirm if they can hear me? Okay. Great. Okay. All right. All right, then. Okay, hello, Mayo. Mayo just told me he can hear me. That is very, very fine. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to all our viewers all around the world. And we're so excited to be here. Personally, I'm so excited to be here. It's always a really, really good time having to come together to learn about cloud, to improve ourselves together, and just basically have a splendid time. So I'm really, really happy to be here, and I'm very sure you're also happy to be here as well. So this our study series has been brought to us by our AWS Cloud Security User Group for West Africa, and it has been an incredible journey so far. We've had our series for about a month plus now, and we've seen a lot of interesting speakers, interesting topics, just diving into all the juiciness of the cloud. So I'm really, really happy to be here once more, like I have said, and I hope that every single person who is going to be on our stream is going to have a splendid time, just like myself and every other person. So for introduction sake, my name is Mimi Swem, and I am a very, very big enthusiast in the cloud. I'm no stranger to the cloud and cloud technologies at all. I'm also currently the AWS Cloud Captain for Nigeria, an AWS User Group Ambassador, and so many other things. You can always feel free to check me out on LinkedIn. But now down to the main reason why we're here, we're going into our study series and we're about to meet our speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, our speaker today is an excellent individual when it comes to cloud with so much experience, so much to share, so much knowledge, to impact and everything all together. So it's a really, really beautiful session because we have him in our midst today. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be giving a sparkling round of applause wherever we are as we welcome Pokeme David. <laughs> Hi, okay. Just give a virtual, a virtual clap. <laughs> exactly. Hiya. Yeah. Hi. So, yes. uh, so I, we're going to be learning DevOps. Can I can hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So, guys, today we're going to be learning all about DevOps, containers, and serverless computing on AWS. And our amazing speaker here, Ukeme, is going to be taking us through this interesting topic. So, at this point in time, I'm going to be leaving your screens and giving room for Ukeme to go on and tell us all about the interesting thing he has for today. So, Ukeme, over to you. Thank you so much for having us and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, so, you guys might be surprised surprised seeing me here um i'm not meant to be here actually it's meant to be rafael rafael is meant to take today's session but for some reasons he can't make it so i had to step in and cover up for him and we'll be taking a different oh maya one yes maya one never misses a session i i had the privilege to meet my um over the weekend very very intelligent and a fantastic personality yes yeah, so we'll be taking a different topic um we won't be taking what we announced because the speaker isn't around and i'll be doing this talk on devops containers and serverless computing on aws a uh, very interesting uh topic uh so let's get to it it's taking a while for my slides to load I'm trying to load the next page i have no idea why this thing is taking time to load mimi can you see my slides
maybe. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try to figure out why my slides isn't changing. You can see it, okay, but on my end it's not like switching. I tried to switch it, but it's not switching from here. This is weird. Okay, so I think I'll put this off and share my screen. Well, if I share my screen, I will be able to see the comments. So Mimi should cover me up there. Let's do this. Um, share my screen. Yeah, so let's get to it. Before I do that, let me see if, okay, we're on the same page, good. So let me do this. Yes, great. So today we'll be talking about DevOps, containers, and serverless computing on AWS. And yours truly. Um, before we get deep into the the matter or the topic, let's let's just give a, a general overview of what we're talking about. So DevOps, containers, serverless computing are three essential components of modern software development and deployment, right? So DevOps combines software development and IT operation. The dev and the ops. The dev is for development, software development. The ops is for operations, which is IT operations. And then it promotes, contribute, it promotes uh, collaboration and efficiency through continuous integration, delivery, and deployment. So it's much more than continuous integration and delivery with deployment, but uh, there's also monitoring, automation, and other aspects of uh, DevOps. But those are like the common, the common, uh, common ones. And then we have containers. So, what is a container? Right, a container is a lightweight, portable way to package applications and their dependencies, enabling scalability and resource efficiency. So. It's a way to package, lightweight way to package your application, right? Uh, serverless computing, so this is just a general overview. You can go ahead, do your research on those uh, to get more deeper knowledge, but it's a general overview. Serverless computing, it's uh, an abstract, uh, it abstracts away infrastructure management, right? Allowing developers to focus on writing code and look automatically scaling resources based on demand. So let's underline a few things there. Infrastructure management. Any serverless technology takes away infrastructure management. You don't need to um, know a lot about the underlying infrastructure of that technology, right? So it makes things easier. It just abstracts that part of the entire, the entire thing. And it allows developers to focus on writing code and automatically scaling resources based on demand. Together, these technologies revolutionize software development by streamlining processes, improving scalability, and reducing operational complexities. Right. So what you see here now is the AWS Dev Tools in the context of AWS code pipeline right so we take everything from the left to the right i've covered this before in some one of the previous sessions i think two months ago but we'll take it again so the what you see here now is a is a pipeline right it starts with the author which is where you write your code the vs code or whatnot 
for here AWS we have AWS Cloud9 that does that. It's kind of like a a counterpart to VS Code, but this runs on the cloud. It runs actually runs on an EC2 machine, right? So AWS Cloud9 is an ID, right, and is a part of the AWS DevTools uh, service. That's for authoring. The next thing is your source, right? There needs to there needs to be a a single source of truth for your application. It needs to be somewhere residing somewhere, which is the source, right? And we have AWS code pipe uh, code comments for that, which is a counterpart to GitHub, right? So you push your code to the source, single source of truth, which in this case for AWS is AWS code comments. And then the next thing, after you you have your ID writing your code, you need to push your code somewhere to repo, right? The next thing is to build that code. And usually in the CI CD pipeline, that build is usually automated, right? So we have a service in AWS called AWS Code Build that actually builds your code based on some form of web hook, right? How does this work? So I can have, let's say, three branches in my organization's repo, right? There's a dev branch, there's a staging branch, there's the production branch. So for, in most cases, for, for your code to be in production branch, or in fact, in any of these branches, for your code to fully run or move to the next stage or the next branch, you need to build that code, right? It needs to be in some form of image or an artifact, right? So that's where building, the building stage comes in. So there needs to be a hook. There usually is a hook that once you push to this particular repo or this particular branch, automatically build the project and give us an artifact, right? So which sometimes is a Docker image or maybe a jar file, if it's a Java application or whatnot, you know? So AWS code build does that build stage in the entire pipeline. The next thing is testing. You can also do your testing on AWS code build or you use other third party, third party services to do your testing. Uh, testing is actually very important to know if your code actually passes some specific benchmarks or some specific rules. If it does pass those rules, then it gets to the deployment stage. If at any point in time, any of, whether it's in the source or the build or the test, if something goes wrong, you can detect that error or anomaly early before it gets into production or deployment. That's why having a proper pipeline is very good. You, you catch problems before they even, I don't want to say before they exist because they already exist. So you catch problems before they escalate or before they move to production. You know, so that's it for testing, very important. And then the next thing after testing, once it passes the testing phase, it gets to deployment. Deployment is actually very interesting because there's different ways to deploy, there are different resources on AWS to deploy on. So basically, in a nutshell, you are deploying to a compute service, right? Except, except uh, S3, S3, which is not a compute, compute service, but, but you can actually deploy to S3, right? That's an anomaly, but it works. If you have an HTML code or whatnot, I just want a static website, you can deploy to S3 and S3 will serve that through maybe a cloud front distribution, you know, that kind of thing. You have your, your websites live on the internet. But in a traditional sense, you only deploy to a compute service. What what, what do I mean by compute service? A service that does the the thinking and the the <laughs> the weight lifting doing the calculations itself, right? AWS has a couple of that, in fact a lot of that, but we'll cover that in the next slide. Um, those compute services you deploy to. So AWS Code Deploy does that, um, does the deployment. And then the next thing is monitoring. You need to have monitoring set up. In most companies, they have SREs 
that site reliance engineers who actually who actually monitor the ability. I mean, monitoring is a very, 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 very important aspect of the SDLC uh, cycle. Um, so with AWS, we have CloudWatch to do that. And we also have some other uh, AWS service, managed service, uh, like Prometheus, uh, FluentD, and I think we now have a Grafana, a managed Grafana service on AWS. All this will help you with monitoring, uh, detecting errors, anomalies, um, uh, checking if your application is is in the right state. If not, it, it, it's going to send a, a an alert, or depending on how your configuration is, sends an alert to the developer, to the DevOps team, and then they find out what's going on. We go back to that cycle again. To fix the issue, you need to write code on your, on your IDE and whatnot. So this now isn't really a straight line, but actually a cycle, right? So that's the, this is the, the fleet of services that AWS has for um, our dev tools. And there's one more service that actually does this entire thing. Remember, these are like independent services, but there's one service that can take you through all of this um, all at once, which is the AWS code pipeline, right? So we've covered this, dev tools on AWS. All right, so let's talk about containers on AWS. Remember, we said containers Containers are like lightweight, um, lightweight environments you package your application in, you know. So, but then it brings you to the question, it brings you to this question, what is the difference between a virtual machine and a container? Because a virtual machine almost does the same thing as a container, but actually they are two different, very, very different things. Um, virtual machine, also known as a VM or a node in most cases, is a is a virtualization of an actual computer what do i mean the hardware components of a computer can actually be virtualized so you have your cpu you have your your ram you have your hard disk you have your what do you have again all of those components can actually be virtualized or abstracted as software you know what is still is a full computer, right? So that's a VM, you know? And then it has uh, an underlying OS. It has an underlying OS, maybe Windows or whatnot. It has an hypervisor. And then the next step, it also has, um, then it has binaries and then your application on the very high layer. I wish I had that image to show you the architecture of a VM and a container, but a container, a container doesn't have an underlining OS. It has what you call a base image. It's built on a base image. The base image sits on top of an engine, a runtime, container runtime engine. And the popular ones we have is, uh, we have Docker, we have um, container D and whatnot, right? So it's lightweight, it stays, it creates an isolated environment that can be consistent in any way you put it. So if I have an application running on my local computer, and then I try to send that same code to someone who is using a different architecture in terms of their own computer, we find out that it won't work, right? That's where containers come in, that's where Docker come in. So the developer would have to package that application as a container and that container can be, or as an image, yes. Package application as an image, and that image, with that image, you can send it to anybody anywhere. They can create a container out of it, very lightweight stuff, and your application would run anywhere, anytime, right? So, with all that explanation being said, you probably have an idea of what container is, but I'll say it again. Containers and lightweight standalone and executable units that package software and its dependencies, enabling consistent deployment across different environments. So, what are the advantages? First of all, portability, scalability, resource efficiency. That's resource efficiency. 
is very, very important. Isolation also helps in terms of security, reproducibility. <laughs> so you can easily reproduce your application anywhere. You can create different copies of it because there's a there's an image you can you can always duplicate and create containers out of. It helps in terms of continuous integration and deployments. Containers facilitate streamlined CI/CD processes. Easy and fashioning and rollback. So if you have an issue with the previous version, you can always roll back to uh, the preceding <laughs> version. Okay, this diagram brings me to compute service. And now let's explain what's going on here. AWS container service com combinations on AWS. So these are the container service combinations on AWS, right? And like I said, compute service is the is the brain, the service that actually does the the thinking and the mathematics and all the algorithms and everything that needs processing, right? And in AWS, we have two major services that support containerization. We have, I'll start from the right, we have ECS, which is Elastic Container Service. We have EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service. Let me check. Let me just check if I have any questions or anything in the chat. Okay, okay. Looks good. Looks good. Let's let's move on. Looks good. Yeah. So Elastic Container Service is the ECS service that AWS offers is also an orchestration tool, right? Orchestrating a swarm or a fleet of containers, right? We also have EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service. Kubernetes is open source, and this is the AWS flavor of Kubernetes, right? Uh, Kubernetes is also a container orchestration tool. Now, on both hands, there is the hosting type the infrastructure. Underneath ECS and EKS, there's the basic infrastructure, which is the, like I said, compute service. Is an, there's an EC2 and then there's Fargate on both hands. You can either create your containers in the EC2 or create your containers using between EC2 and Fargate. I almost would say Fargate is serverless because you do not have an access to the underlying infrastructure, infrastructure right? So we, EC2 and Fargate are both machines in a sense. They are both machines. So with EC2, let me just check if I have anything. Okay. Okay, I have more viewers. Good, 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 good. So with EC2 now, you have access to the underlying infrastructure. I can go inside the machine, SSH inside the machine, and change anything I want to change, play around with it, configure what I need to configure, because I have the power to. <laughs> but with Fagit, Fagit makes things easier for you. You don't need to truly be a DevOps engineer to play around with Fagit. You can click, 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 and you have your infrastructure all in place, but you don't have access to the underlying infrastructure. You really can't SSH into a Fagate instance. And Fagate is actually cheaper compared to EC2 because you 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 run your containers in like the uh, you run it like a like a tax, right? You don't obviously run it as a container. You run it as a tax. So there's tax and services, and then there's a tax definition you need to create. This is our Fagate and ECS. You create a tax definition that has the configuration of the type of machine you want to create. How many RAM do you want to put? How many uh, vCPUs do you want it to have? Um, um, what's the a container? What's the image you want to use to build the container? You know those kind of things, which is your tax definition, right? So you have that with um, ECS Fagate, okay? But I'm going to give you a caveat. 
the caveat here is remember i said you don't have access to the underlying infrastructure but for us if i want to ssh into the file gate i can actually do it right you ssh using a bastion host if it's a file gate um, host type you ssh using a a bastion host you can do some research for what the bastion host is because normally you won't have any any free public ip to access that mission so that's it with the host type for uh for ecs and then with kubernetes like you know kubernetes works with pods pods is like the smallest unit of kubernetes is a pod and um, inside the pod you probably have containers inside of pods you know so that's how kubernetes works but the point is whether you call it pod or whether you call it containers or whatnot they all run they all have a compute engine that compute engine is either issue to or fag it do you get so that's that's the explanation on this container service combinations on aws and that's our two major um, container services eks ecs yeah so we have what's the time now i should be wrapping up soon aws container options by layers okay this is also a very interesting interesting diagram if you look at this now with aws there are some legacy services and there are some abstracted services right legacy services are services the main main services the first few services that aws built and then the abstracted services are services that were built on top of on top of legacy service examples of legacy services ec2 and s3 almost every other service on aws would one way or the other be using <laughs> using one of those two you know so in this layer in this uh, container options layer let's start from the bottom because of the previous slide before this right compute compute service ec2 fagit right that guys doing the computing the heavy lifting then to orchestrate a fleet or a cluster of ec2 or fagate infrastructure or host type you have ecs we have ks you have rosa i don't really know much about rosa but ecs and eks is what we covered in the previous in the previous slide and then on the top layer on the top layer is services that are very very easy to use where any tom the canary can come to aws and deploy an application we want to make deployments as easy as clicking buttons right so aws app runner is one of those aws elastic beanstalk very popular service is one of those amazon light sale amazon light sale gives you a predictable price for spinning up an instance so with ec2 you can't really predict it because you pay per hour yes you pay per hour for ec2 but with amazon light sale you can pay per month so you can like project your costs without really thinking about any variations in, in terms of cost with ec2 you pay for what you use with amazon light sale you pay upfront for the month or maybe for the year kind of like a reserved instance but it's usually very cheap and it's easy to set up right my website is hosted on amazon like light so so that's it that's what this layers are all about the top top most layers are easy to easy to spin up services uh, uh and and whatnot all right so Let's go to serverless computing. Should be rounding up. Serverless computing does not mean there's no server. <laughs> so when you hear serverless computing, at first glance you think, oh, 
so there's no server but someone is doing the the, the compute work right right no one's kind of compute load but that's not true <laughs> there is actually a server there's actually some service doing the compute right but let's let's talk about this definition so serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model it's easy a model where developers can focus solely on writing code without managing having to manage the underlying infrastructure so it means aws manages the infrastructure for you it's called serverless because you are not managing the service just upload your code and jesus will rise from the dead that kind of thing <laughs> so um yes yes that's what it means um aws manages the underlying infrastructure so there are different types of uh, different things we need to we need to note about serverless computing there's event driven architecture right <laughs> So with event-driven architecture, is serverless computing follows an event-driven model where functions or services are triggered by specific events or requests. Just so you know, some most serverless, most serverless uh, services are actually cheaper because in some cases, I'm not saying all, in some cases, right, you, you won't really pay if your service is not running. So there needs to be an event that triggers something that triggers your service. Do you get? So if nothing triggers your service, then nothing is running. <laughs> so in this case, it's saying functions or services are triggered by specific events or requests, right? Paper use pricing. So with serverless computing, users are build based on the actual usage of resource rather than per allocated capacity that's what i just explained that it's cheaper so you pay for what you use so if your events are not triggered and your request is not running based on triggered events you probably won't be paying anything right or you pay less right so it's quite cheap uh autom automatic scale so in some cases, in most cases, you set up auto scaling for your compute instances. In the sense, what do I mean? That if you have a machine and you have a lot of requests, like people actually trying to access your machine, and you use up all the resource of that machine, CPU utilization gets to hundred or let's say 90 or 80 memory gets to 90 or 80 or whatnot it can actually trigger auto scaling so your 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 workload would auto scale to accommodate to accommodate the requests the influx of requests you have which is a very very nice feature and most of these things is to make sure that you don't have downtime with aws there's zero downtime to AWS. Someone comes to tell me that, oh, it's like AWS has crashed. It's actually impossible. <laughs> it's actually impossible for AWS cloud services to crash. It, you can have a region or maybe a, a zone that might not be reachable. But then if you have multi-region set up, your application will still be available in other regions that people can you can easily just route traffic to the other regions where your service is available. So no server management still brings us back to the main thing I've been talking about. Serverless says serverless computing abstracts away the infrastructure management, including servers, including server provisioning, maintenance, and operating system updates. So you have no business with any of those things if you use serverless. Upload your code and everything will be fine. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So these are <clears throat> these are examples of AWS um, 
uh, serverless, serverless services. Lambda, very popular. Lambda is serverless. Lambda runs code to retrieve local information. So this is like, okay, so this is like a flowchart. Let's explain the flowchart from the left to right. Amazon S3 host is hosting your front end code, right? For an app, right? Amazon S3 is hosting your first front end code. Um, the client, which is the user, clicks on the website or app to get the information. From there, a request is sent to Amazon API Gateway. All right, from the client, it goes to API Gateway. Uh, the app makes a REST API call to the endpoint, right, which is a Amazon API Gateway. <coughs> API Gateway you send data to Lambda, right, which is your true serverless service. So in this case, Lambda is a compute. DynamoDB is a database, but the compute and DB are both serverless services. So sends data to Lambda. Lambda runs the code to retrieve local information, pushes it to uh, database. DynamoDB contains the data. It gets that data, goes back to Lambda. Lambda to the API endpoint. The API endpoint serves that data to the user. So this is typ a typical, like, workflow of how you can actually implement serverless technology in your next build is this my last slide <laughs> it seems this is my last slide that's not a good way to end but anyways you get the point we've talked about devops we've talked about containers we've talked about serverless computing so i'll have to stop here for today yes any questions any questions? Mimi, Mimi, are you there? Do you have any questions? Please, please post them in the chat. Um, I'll be here to answer all your questions. Maya Ware is someone who, who doesn't miss any session and he always asks questions. Maya, why do you have any question for us today? All right, let me call Mimi back. Mimi. Yes. Wow, 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 wow. Amazing session. Amazing session, guys. Please, let's give a sparkling round of applause in our rooms for Ukeme. <laughs> that was an amazing thank you, thank one. You. And I'm sure we all learned so much from this as well. Considering the fact that Ukeme didn't even initially know he was going to come up for an impromptu presentation, he did outstandingly well. And that is the point of being a part of this community. You get to meet outstanding talents. Nowhere else do you just pull up someone and tell them, oh, you have a session today and they are up and going. That's the power of the community. And that is why you have to keep on coming, keep on training yourself until one day you get to the levels where you never believed you could attain. So thank you once more um, to Ukeme for this amazing session. Another big shout out to Mayowa. That's so true. Mayowa has always been a consistent, consistent person. If tomorrow I come and hear that he's currently sitting at a very high position, I would not be surprised at all because these are the sacrifices that some people are not ready to make. But he's here every single session, tirelessly learning, developing himself, improving his, his skills. And with time, it's really just a matter of time. He's definitely going to be up there. And we're going to be all happy to know that this was where it all began to a large extent. We all started together and we watched ourselves grow individually. Now you can also be part of the discussion. You can, if you're definitely interested in being a part of the speakers or the moderators, there's always room for this. Like we said, the community is here to build you in all aspects and all ramifications of your life. We're looking as well as your hands-on skills too so please come close to the community also feel free to follow us on our social media platforms as well if you're not part of the aws user group whatsapp group then you should definitely be part of it so you can feel free to drop a message if you're not added on the group and we can see how we can get you involved because a lot of messages are being dropped there opportunities from various angles vouchers different things basically so come and be part of the goodness happening in your very community
that was once more for everyone who came on today and on behalf of myself and every other member of this amazing community we wish you a splendid night rest morning rest afternoon rest whatever it is basically and we hope nothing short of the best for you and yours thank you and god bless